it was a very uh, terrible realization for a child to understand that the way that racism represents itself is through invisibility. Oh, well, I um, knew that I was a stand-up comic. Like, I always knew when I was a child. I think my earliest thought of it maybe was about seven years old or something when I kind of started to understand what the profession was. And that was from watching people like Flip Wilson and, and Joan Rivers and um, Richard Pryor, um, seeing them on television and starting to understand that this was actually a job, that, that people would tell jokes and, you know, they would laugh and then you... Uh, could actually make a life from that. And once I understood that, then I knew that was going to be my job. And so when I started doing comedy, it really was, um, it was the first time I did it was about 14. And I think um, I just knew that was the right thing, that I knew that this was my life. And it wasn't um, any kind of revelation. Like I knew what I was doing, um, I knew what I was going to do. I knew where I was going. I knew once I started to uh, write and do sets all the time um, as a comic, it, it was a very natural thing. Um, I just committed to it right away. I, I didn't really care about school. I didn't really care about anything else uh, other than comedy. And that's still true to this day. Like I still have the same um, passion for it and the same kind of understanding and awareness of the craft of stand-up comedy. It's a very, um, I don't know, it, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, internal thing. It's a very um, soulful thing. Uh, I just, I love, I love the art form. I don't know how long it took me to find my voice. It was more, it, it took me longer to grow up. You know, I was just a child when I started and um, kind of remained a child for many years. I, I think just because I didn't have uh, the company of people my age, I didn't have a really solid education. So I was um, kind of in clubs and around comics. And uh, I guess that sort of arrested my development a little bit. And so, you know, it wasn't really so much about finding my voice as a comic. It was more about finding my voice as a person and actually becoming an adult. Um, that took longer. But I, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it was the same process of that, that suddenly everything clicked because it actually was right away, you know, something that I knew that I was doing right. So I don't, I don't know if uh, it all came together or I think my style developed over the years after being um, exposed to so many great people and great artists, but I, I can't say there was any uh, moment where I truly found my voice. I was influenced by a lot of different people. I really was influenced a lot by Joan Rivers. I think um, Paula Poundstone was another person who was incredibly influential. Uh, around the time that I started, um, there was a lot of people that were major, people like Bobcat Goldthwait, um, people like Sandra Bernhardt. Um, they really helped me understand the art form better. And uh, I, just, I, I, I just think that, you know, I'm lucky because I, I got to be around such great people when I was starting and, you know, got to work with such great people. I, I worked with Bill Hicks, um, who was also tremendously influential. Um, I just, uh, I, I, I got lucky in the beginning. When I was performing when I first started, it really felt uh, like I had um, had a lot of struggles as a kid and I never really fit in anywhere. And then finally, like as a performer, I figured out my place in the world. Like I figured out, oh, this is why I'm such a weirdo and a freak. This is why, <laughs> because I'm supposed to do this. And, and finding that home within stand-up comedy was so meaningful and uh, really helped me um, be at ease with all of the things that I thought were sort of abnormal about me, you know, weird about me. I, I, I think everything kind of made sense when I found myself as a performer in that way. Well, I um, was really uh, disappointed because I watched television so much as a kid. I think partly because I had no supervision. You know, my parents were recent immigrants. They were very poor. They worked all the time. They had no concept of like, a babysitter or daycare or any of that. So really television was my babysitter. And, and I remember watching television and then kind of gradually realizing that I did not look like any of the people on there. And it was such a grave disappointment that I was not represented in any way 
at all. And, and it, it really, um, I think, shook me in a very existential way. It, it, it was a very uh, terrible realization for a child to understand that the way that racism represents itself is through invisibility. And it's something that you can't really explain to people who aren't that same kind of invisible, you know? And, it, and that invisibility leads to another kind of grave existential dilemma of not feeling like you exist and therefore not pursuing things because uh, there is this feeling that you wouldn't exist anyway beyond a certain point. And so I, I, I always theorize that's why there are not a lot of Asian Americans in show business because we don't see ourselves reflected back into show business. So there's no goal. There's no... Uh, point to get to. And um, it's something that's really difficult to uh, articulate. It's something very difficult to fight because of that. Um, but I, I remember feeling like so left out by um, television, you know, this thing that really raised me. Oh, well, Star Search was a huge phenomenon. I mean, you know, when we think about Star Search now, I think the only thing I could equate it to would be American Idol. I mean, it was a very, very big deal at the time. And um, it was something that I really aspired to being on, you know, and I, I knew that there was a comedy category and I knew that there was a possibility that I could do it. And um, so I went and I, 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 I guess I, whatever, applied or auditioned or, 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 or whatever. I don't remember what it was, but I, I um, was asked to be on it, but I was not asked to be on the regular Star Search, which was like, I guess, over a season of competing, you, um, you do like several sets that I, I, was, I was actually picked out to do Star Search International, which was a very, very condensed version of the contest where you had people from other countries come and compete and didn't really make sense because I was so clearly American, but because that was the only way I could get on the show, I did it, you know, and I um, competed against a guy uh, from England, so he actually was uh, um, international, and then I, I competed against another guy from Canada, who I, I don't know if that counts as international, because <laughs> it's still North America, but um, anyway, it was, it was kind of like this weird thing, and I um, was uh, asked during uh, the um, whole process, you know, could I make my set more international, could you just be more international and and I, I could never figure out exactly what they want I mean I kind of knew what they wanted but I don't I don't know how I could have delivered what they wanted because that was so not who I was I mean they would have preferred that I was foreign I guess but that was the only way they could put me anywhere is, is to put me in this international category um, which is okay I mean it, it is better than not being on the show at all and, and and part part of me thinks like they saw me and invented that so that I could be on it, you know, that, that there was a, a degree of, oh, I have an idea, why don't we do this if, if we have that person, so I don't know. Anyway, I didn't win. Uh, I don't remember who won. I think the guy from England won, maybe because he really was international. Um, and uh, it, was, um, it was a good experience. I mean, I, I think anything like that, you know, when you're like on these shows that are really big, no matter how they're framed, it's still good for you and it's still um, a great opportunity. Yeah, well, I mean, people want to uh, have a reason why I'm going to be hired. I can't just, like, when I was younger, um, there was this, always this idea that you had to justify my existence because the, the fact is that Asian Americans are so invisible in television that um, when one does appear, they can't just appear on their own. There has to be a whole backstory to um, justify their existence. And uh, you see this on like crime shows, like when, where you, when you see an Asian person, there's always like trouble in Chinatown. You know, they're like from like a, the, the Chinese division or some kind of like uh, triad or <laughs> golden triangle thing is happening. So, I mean, it, it is like, um, you know, in the same way that crime shows justify the use of Asian Americans, they, they still needed that for even this like comedy show that was sort of based in reality, but not really too. Well, when I did All American Girl, the, 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 the atmosphere of television was that there were um, a lot of stand-up comedians who were having shows built around them. And uh, all the networks were trying to look for a way to, um, I guess, uh, separate themselves from the pack. You know, they all wanted to have uh, something that was signature, something that was groundbreaking, something that was new. Um, and 
because of that, um, because of my appearance as a stand-up comic, um, th there was kind of a thing where, you know, there was this, this kind of like buzz in the industry looking for a comic to build a show around. There was this desire for networks to uh, differentiate themselves from the other networks. There was uh, my enthusiasm and my uh, newness um, and, uh, you know, my talent, which at that point was um, still, I guess, being developed. But I, I also had a very clear point of view and... and um, was a very strong performer. And so, you know, all these things together um, really made it uh, the perfect environment for me to have my own show. And when I did that show, it was really, um, I just wanted a job and I wanted to be on television and I wanted to uh, work as, as like big as I could. You know, I wanted to just do as, as much as I could. And, um, I was really desperate to do anything. I didn't know anything about writing or I didn't know anything about TV or how it works. And I, I didn't really know about the people that I was working with, the, the writers that I was working with. I just knew that I wanted this chance. And so it was, it was a really important thing for me to just get there. You know, I just wanted to get there. But I never felt like I broke through anything because I never felt like I belonged even when I was in that environment, even when I had my own television show and was kind of around all of these people who also had their own shows on that network, I never felt that I was uh, a part of that community. I always felt somehow um, left out or put out of it. Everybody was really welcoming and everybody was really nice, but it was very much like we were our own entity because so much emphasis was put on our... Um, ethnicity and, and the fact that we were Asian American. That, that took us out of comedy. It took us out of the job that we were supposed to do, which was to be, you know, 22 minutes of comedy. We were actually like more of a social commentary, which is very difficult to uh, marry. And, and especially in the eight o'clock hour, it's, it's, it's almost an impossible thing to do. Um, so it was a very weird circumstance. You know, it was like, um, I, I can't even equate anything like happening now in television to that because th there is no comparison. It was this very, very strange phenomenon. The thing about me was that I was not um, really what they wanted as a, as a star. You know, they didn't have these attributes that they think of when they think of like a female star of a show. They, you know, I wasn't thin, I wasn't white, I wasn't... Um, you know, all these things that they thought were the, the perfect thing. And so they were trying to make me look like the other stars, which uh, it was really impossible. So I was, um, when, when we did the first screen tests for All American Girl, they, they, the, the major problem was that I was too overweight to play the role of myself, which is insane if you think about it. But I, I didn't know that that was crazy then. I just wanted to keep my job. So I lost a lot of weight very, very quickly, uh, which is not good. And I got very sick and I was hospitalized and it was like horrible, horrible thing. And, um, you know, and the show was canceled anyway. And it, it's like such a terrible thing because I, I still have some health issues from that, you know, from losing weight in such a rapid, rapid way. But also like I, I it kind of gave me like issues with eating and, and weight for years now, 20 years later, I still have problems. And it's a very, it's a very strange thing to put on a comedian, you know, to, uh, tell a comedian that they have to look a certain way because that's sort of what we've been um, avoiding all of our lives. You know, usually if we're in comedy, um, the, there is like no emphasis on the way we look. It's all about what we're saying. And here suddenly the way that I look became very important. And so it was a very difficult thing to put a young woman in, you know, like it's a diff difficult situation. And I didn't know exactly how to deal with it other than do what they said. And, um, you know, it's like I, I look at it, look I look back on it now and I realize um, they just didn't really deal with the fact that I wasn't white. I think that because I wasn't white, they had to somehow make me conform in other ways that um, would make me more pal palatable to uh, an audience. You know, they were trying to. Uh, um, cut the fact that I was not white, you know, as if my non-whiteness was some kind of an offense. So they were trying to cut it with, well, she's thin or she's pretty or she, you know, something that would make me more of a, a package they could present to their audience. Um, 
and you know, uh, by to their sponsors. Really, I mean, it's a very weird thing. You know, when you're the first uh, person to kind of cross over this racial barrier, then um, you 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 are scrutinized for all these other things that have nothing to do with race, but they have everything to do with race. It's a very strange, strange thing. I uh, I know from being raised in this culture that Koreans have a very, very uh, conservative point of view and, and also um, pretty sexist. You know, they, they would rather always be represented by men than women. Um, my uh, stand-up comedy at the time was very, it, it was very raw, very, very honest and difficult for the community to get behind because it wasn't something they could really um, say that they were proud of, it, but, but the fact was I was the only one doing it, you know, and so they didn't have anybody else. And uh, so when I started doing um, my show, there was a lot of controversy and a lot of people were really angry. You know, a lot of Korean community leaders were like complaining and there was a lot of like op-ed pieces in, in uh, Korean newspapers. This was like before blogs. So this is like you know, in print, like seeing things about myself. And I was so angry because I thought this community would support me, especially because of what had happened with the LA riots, because we had such a negative, um, I guess, a negative um, stereotype of what we were out there. I thought that something like being um, in a sitcom it would, would be a positive thing. Um, but now, you know, I go, I, I go around and I, I see a lot of people who, um, saw me and they, they, they saw me as the first Asian person they ever saw on television and they were so proud and, and they uh, grew up in uh, a generation that didn't feel invisible because of my existence and so therefore they didn't feel like they were invisible or unimportant because of my existence. So I think that's a wonderful thing and it's all kind of come around. You know, I think my longevity has um, forced the Korean community to really accept my presence and, and, and really grow to love my presence but then it was pretty controversial. No, there aren't a huge number of Asian Americans on television. I think right now um, there are uh, a few great actors, you know, and they're, they're in shows, and, and you see many more now than you did then. But at the same time, there's no um, entire show based on, you know, family. Or um, I think that there are some examples here and there, you know, of, of shows that have a lot more... Asian Americans, or you know, shows like Outsourced, and there's there's definitely people that are key, um, people like Sandra Oh, and th there's like you know the um, Harold and Kumar movies, which those guys are really great, and you know it's like th there is a presence, um, but there needs to be more. I think it, it's not like um, anywhere near what uh, it should be, and any anywhere near what what the um, population actually reflects. No, I mean, I think it, it's really um, it's really flawed the way that uh, race is viewed in television and in films. It's really um, it's really flawed, and it's really uh, you know something that I I'm not sure exactly how to continue approaching or how to do other than just do my own work and just do my thing. But it's it's really a frustrating thing. But Again, it's like, how do you combat that invisibility? You know, it's hard to say. It's like not out, out and out racism that we're dealing with. It's, 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 um, it is that subtle non-inclusion that is, is very hard to overcome and hard to identify in the first place. Well, I think that um, there is an idea that when you're talking about Asian Americans that there needs to be an authenticity, sort of like there's a stamp of historical... <laughs> accuracy that is placed on our existence and you know that that really limits the the variety of experience that we're capable of that that humans are capable of and and um, we don't require that sort of like stamp of authenticity on any other like you know if you think about even um, white minorities like or um, you know white ethnicity so you don't have that sort of stamp of approval that needs to be there there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff like if you Think about it, um, like I, I uh, one of the problems with All American Girl that, that a lot of people had, not just the Korean community, was that all of the Asian actors were um, from different ethnicities, you know, different nationalities. They were uh, people that were um, Chinese and people that were uh, Japanese and, and um, even Amy Hill, who is biracial. So that there was like 
an issue with that, that they were all Korean. And yet, you know, there's always actors, white actors doing like different accents, doing things that are not of their origin, you know, that, that they're, they're, they're not from their country of origin or whatever. And um, it's totally acceptable. And so for some reason, we were held up into this sort of scrutiny or this, this need for cultural authenticity that white people were not. Oh, yeah. I think that women of color in any profession that kind of calls for us to be really exceptional have to be um, even more so because um, our work is discounted because of our gender, our race. It's always going to be discounted. You know, it, it, it's like um, there, there is uh, this feeling of doubt uh, around um, our abilities that it, it occurs that in not even like a conscious judgment of people, it's not even conscious, like their racism and sexism isn't even conscious. It's just um, something we have to break through. We have to break through so many barriers to get to um, an, and sort of a level playing field. It's really an impossible thing. And I, I, I really try to encourage women in comedy. I try to encourage women of color especially. Um, but it's very, uh, very few that actually are able to succeed or overcome um, what society views uh, uh, stand-up comedy as being um, or entertainment as being. It's a very, very tough thing. I think stand-up comedy for women of color is the hardest profession. I think that... Um, you probably have an easier time in singing or maybe even in acting, maybe. But I think in, in comedy, uh, there, there is a, a need for us to be empowered. Uh, that's a strike against us because most women of color have a hard time being that. You have to be so uh, in control, have to have people like assume that you're in control um, and listen. It's, it's so many barriers. I, I, I don't know how I got here. I don't know how people get here. Um, it's very, very difficult. The people I really looked up to were, um, well, Joan Rivers was major. I think Joan Rivers, if I, if I really think about um, the amount of uh, inspiration um, that I got from her, she's somebody that was so fearless and, and so uh, incredibly vivacious and alive and, and um, powerful and, and a woman and, and um, just a really singular force. I think she was truly phenomenal. I, I, I think I remember my favorites like was when she was like doing sets on Saturday Night Live and just you never saw that either like people doing stand-up comedy on Saturday Night Live even though even though it was like a venue for stand-up comics you, you didn't see stand-up comedy on there and when I saw her on there it was like so powerful and um, you know Richard Pryor for stand-up comedy films that that honesty and that incredible um, vulnerability was so influential. Um, I think Eddie Murphy also uh, incredibly influential. Uh, Sandra Bernhard later on, um, you know, she uh, I think really changed the idea of what comedy should be or it changed expectation, um, changed the format of it. Uh, she was really influential and then probably more recently somebody like um, Janine Garofalo who I think really influenced a whole generation of, of comics to change the entire entire uh, art form um, for the better. Yeah, I thought what was great about Joan Rivers is that she was going in this direction that was totally new, totally irreverent, that just um, didn't care about anybody but the audience. Like, she didn't care about anybody but the audience and making them laugh and... and um, it was so genius, you know, it was so inspiring to see somebody that um, was so irreverent and so um, powerful. You know, she, um, I think it, it, it was not just talking about things that women wanted to hear. I think it was, she was just talking about things that nobody would say, but everybody was thinking. And that's really amazing. Oh, I loved Carol Burnett. I loved her show and I, I loved... Um, I loved what, I think my favorite thing about the Carol Burnett show was like how people would laugh within the sketches. Like, you know, when they were doing sketches like, you know, Harvey Corman or, um, <laughs> you know, like Tim Conway, they would always like laugh like in the middle of things. And it was so, I don't know if it was something that 
they had uh, decided to do beforehand or, you know, if something wasn't working that they would say, we'll just like crack up at it and then it'll work better or something. But th there was this beautiful like moment where everything would kind of break down and they would all start laughing and then, you know, the, the, the fourth wall would be broken and the audience would be sort of let in on the joke and it was so magical and, and, and beautiful and, and that I loved. Um, I, I, I loved uh, Carol Burnett's inventiveness. Um, in, in a sense, I guess I didn't identify with her as much because she was a sketch artist. You know, there's a, there's a big difference between sketch comedy and stand-up comedy that, that um, the sketch comedians have the, um, I guess, luxury of falling into the character and being that. And um, stand-up comics, we don't have that. We just have to be ourselves and kind of present our own ideas and our own points of view. And, and so I kind of, like, identified with that more. But Carol Burnett's so funny and so genius and so amazing. And I don't, I don't know, like, I, I, but I look at them very differently. Like somebody like Carol Burnett and Joan Rivers, I, I think they're both very influential, but I really wanted to be Joan Rivers. Well, I met Phyllis Diller um, when I did uh, Bob Hope's Young Comedian Special. Bob Hope used to do this show that was like on every year. It was kind of around Christmas and it was um, the Young Comedian Special. And, and um, I did it and uh, a lot of, a lot of people did the show. Um, it was sort of our first television thing. It was a big deal. And it was on, um, you know, it was on prime time and it, 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 it was a, it, it was a huge show to be on. Um, probably the only thing that compared to it maybe at that time would be like The Tonight Show with, with uh, Johnny Carson. But this even actually had, had a larger audience because it was on earlier and it was um, Bob Hope, you know? And, and so uh, her, uh, like when, when Phyllis Stiller came on, she was like totally um, like this, this like, amazing icon, and both of them. But, but Bob at that point was so old, you couldn't really like, get a handle on where he was looking and what he was doing. You know, he, he wasn't really paying attention to you. He was really in his 90s at that point. And uh, Phyllis was so on it. Like, Phyllis was sarcastic and, and um, kind of, like, very uh, sharp and very together and, 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 and really aware of what was going on and really, really funny and, and really amazing. And so I got to meet her through that show. Um, but, you know, I think when uh, she was doing comedy on television, I, th I was probably too young to have seen it. And then by the time, you know, I was old enough to really be a fan of it, she wasn't there. So she was more um, sort of represented an idea than actual, like, performance, whereas Joan Rivers was doing a lot of that. Oh, I, I think it's great if I'm a, a role model in that way, just because I think, you know, people should do what they want and, and, and be in entertainment if they want to, and they shouldn't let um, these racial barriers hold them back. You know, I think uh, a lot of times, like what I, f I find is really inspiring is like, people are, are into my work because they uh, want to rebel from their parents. You know, they, like I get a lot of friends or family or like, when I was growing up, we were like, you can't do comedy, you can't do, there's no Asians in comedy, you can't do that. And I, I didn't care, like I just did it. and. Um, so I think it's really cool like if people are inspired or they look to me as a role model because they, they are doing something that people are telling them not to do. Um, also like I um, know that there's a lot of Asian Americans who don't pursue art because they're afraid of what their parents would think and so they go into like these careers that they don't really want to be in because they're trying to please their families and that's a mistake, you know? And then they, they're like in their 40s suddenly and they want to start pursuing what they love and not that it's too late, but it, it's definitely, you know, they're, they're at a disadvantage. So I think um, it's good, like, that I inspire people to kind of go for what they want, like, when they want to. And I, I hope that that, that that continues. And it's hard enough to fight against the, 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 the whole machine of show business anyway, and the whole machine of, like, us not belonging anyway. And so when you have to fight your own family and then your own community on top of the societal expectation of what we should be, it's, it's almost impossible. Yeah, I think Rosanna is really great and a great example of what is possible when, when people are totally like um, just powerful and stand in their power and uh, aren't willing to compromise anything. Um, I think that was why Roseanne was so great. You know, that's why the show was so amazing is because she just only cared about 
how the show was going to do. Like, she only cared about what was going to do the show, how it was going to represent her. Um, that's the attitude I should have had going into it, but I didn't have uh, the experience or the knowledge, you know, when I was starting. Like, I didn't know that's what I was supposed to do. And uh, definitely, she was somebody to watch and, and emulate. Oh yes, I'm very proud of what I've been able to accomplish and, and, and proud of what I represent in terms of diversity in television. Um, I'm proud of the fact that I've influenced other people. I'm proud of the fact that I've had longevity in this career, which I always wanted and I'm very, very excited of you know, where things are now. Like I just love stand-up comedy still. I still have an intense um, relationship with it and, and uh, work on it every day. And, and uh, it, it, it's a business that I didn't realize I would love so much, but I, I, I know that I was supposed to do this, and I'm, I'm glad that it's all worked out okay. I remember seeing and being like, oh, that's an Asian person. Like, I remember hearing like Neil Sadaka was going to be on like a TV show. And thinking, Is that guy Asian? I think that um, you know you would get kind of. You get excited if you saw like Michelle Lee, but it wasn't, it wasn't that she was Asian. <laughs> it was like you get kind of like, like oh I know Michelle Lee. Is it that Michelle Lee? No, it's not that Michelle Lee. So there, but the, the you know, uh, it, it's it's funny. Like I remember, um, I was at a party uh, in the mid '90s or something, pretty early early on, and uh, uh, Tom Hanks came up to me and um, he said that he was a fan and and. Um, he said that his, his grandmother or somebody in his family was Chinese. And I was looking at him and I was like, oh my God, you're totally Chinese. And like, like it was so weird to see the Asian-ness in his face. And then, and then, the, then the, I was like, oh, I got to look like for other Asian people. <laughs> and so I was always like trying to look and see who is part Asian. Well, it's Keanu Reeves um, is another one. I don't know who else. Um, but there's, there's people out there. There's, there's, <laughs> there's some Asian and some of the stars, it's just a secret. They're in the, in the closet or something about it. I mean, um, I really don't, uh, I think there was a commercial um, around um, the time I was growing up uh, that was like ring around the collar and there was like an Asian couple in that. Um, I just remember that and I, I was thinking, well, that's strange that um, they're doing laundry at home because they should have a laundry. Um, but the, there really wasn't any, um, you know, there, there was ever once in a while there would be like an Asian star in something like there was like Sai Chin who uh, was in the great, great film Blow Up, the Antonio film, and uh, you would see like glimpses here and there, maybe a, a, a Bond girl here and there, but um, really nobody that I, I could say that, and that's really sad, you know, thinking about it like when I was growing up, yeah, there was nobody that I, I well, there was nobody in comedy. Oh, there was Johnny Yoon, but he was from Korea, um, and, and and sort of presented a very Korean um, foreigner perspective. I mean, he was great, but I can't say that I identified with him because I was such an American kid. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think there was anybody, and I I, I I I think that's really sad to not have anyone. I think the world is gradually getting better. It's not great, you know. I think there should be more. I think there should be more opportunities for all sorts of different people, but. Um, you know, it's hard to break through people's expectations about what entertainment is and what it's supposed to be. And um, I think, you know, it's just going to constantly be a challenge. I, I hope to see uh, more changes in my lifetime, but um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if there will be. I, I do accept the label of pioneer. I think it's a great, I think it's a great thing, and I, 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 I really treasure being considered that. I think it's a beautiful thing. I, I do feel like that. You know, I do feel like that, yeah, I did open the door for a, a lot of reasons and, and um, kept the door open for a lot of different people, so that's good. Um, but I, I'm, um, yeah, I'm proud, and uh, I think it's very appropriate. I feel like, um, yeah, we, the way that, we uh, think about race, and, and we, we think about race a lot of times, I think, in just black and white. And really, there's so many more ways to think about it. And, and um, you know, a lot of times, like, uh, I feel like Asian Americans have it in a strange kind of perspective on it, because we're sort of sometimes thought of as the other white people. So, but we, we, we also don't have all of the privilege, and we have a we have all of the sort of negative 
aspects of not being in the majority, but uh, not any of the positive ones because we're still sort of light. If you like on the, on the, this idea of like a model minority, it like sort of like that, that we sort of follow along there, but it, it, is, it is such a weird thing to try to explain and try to kind of, kind of get the ideas across. And um, I don't know, but uh, it, yeah, it's kind of being like the other, but not um, so weird. I think stereotypes often are based in a kind of ignorance that is, um, or a knowledge is taken after only just a first sight, or what you, you, you know, stereotypes are sort of what, what um, people would rather invent than finding out the real story. And um, so I don't know, I don't know. There is some measure of truth to some stereotypes, I suppose. I guess they wouldn't exist if there wasn't, but it's also, uh, such a limited view of what is possible. So I don't know. Um, I, I want things to change and I, I don't know how to address it other than just kind of reveal my own experience. Um, so yeah, it's very, it's very hard. One of my jokes, like, it's like I, uh, I often assume that I'm white because my eyes are in my head and I, I'm looking, they're looking this way. So that from here, I look really white to myself. <laughs> so that I, I just empower myself with all these like thoughts about being white, and I think the audience kind of like, well, what does that mean? And then they start to understand it. Like when I talk about racial perspective, you have to sort of make it make it in a way that is um, a way that the audience can kind of feel like they're not being preached at or like they're in school, but that there there's sort of a pleasure in learning these things. So I don't know. It, it is something that I do uh, address in my mind that I've got to talk about racial issues and talk about sort of issues of identity, but I, um, I, I, I want to do it in a way that's funny and clever and, you know, makes it entertaining. I love, uh, I lo I love Lucy and I think um, what was pretty powerful was the fact that she was in an interracial marriage at a time where uh, interracial, interracial marriage was really kind of an unfamiliar thing. and. Um, it was just legalized, I think, you know, like, so, but people don't, don't connect that. They don't think about that being an interracial marriage that she was in and, and an interracial partnership that was very um, important, you know, and uh, I, I think I was probably more familiar with the shows, uh, the Lucy show, when they had actually gone to color. And she was um, a lot older at that point. I just remember one when she was um, trapped in a bank vault with the, I guess the bank manager who was sort of the, the, the uh, her nemesis on the show. Um, and they were uh, in, trapped in the vault and they were um, eating uh, dry pasta because they were afraid they were gonna starve. They were only in there for like 20 minutes or for the whole episode. I'm not very rehearsed, I'm pretty spontaneous. I think uh, that is probably what most stand-up comics are. The spontaneity is important because we don't know what the audience is gonna do and it's best to be with them as, a, as opposed to giving them a performance. Like the, the, the um, audience doesn't appreciate a performance as much as they do uh, an engagement. So they, they wanna be with you. They don't want to be um, watching you. They wanna be in it and so that's, um, that communication requires a spontaneity that uh, people who are very rehearsed can't achieve. Um, and also, stand-up comics can't rehearse. You know, you need to have an audience there or else it's, it, 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 it doesn't exist. You know, it's not real. So um, there's a big difference between the, the kind of performers that uh, I guess Lucy and Jackie Gleason were that, that, that exists, I think, in the same realm as like sketch comedy and um, stand-up comedy. It's, it's very, very different. Well, it, it is like kind of, uh, well, uh, you know, my mother like had me in 1968 and my parents were illegal immigrants here. And they, when I was born, they found out that they were illegal immigrants and they deported my father. And then I was here with my mom and it really tore my family apart. And my mother was like really afraid of it ever happening again. And I'm the only member of my family to have been born in America. So she would always push me forward like, she's white. And so that's sort of like the way I view everything is I think that I'm, <laughs> and I think that's why I've been able to kind of do everything that I have done, because I actually think I'm white. <laughs> I think it's really hard. I think that it's, I don't know, it's a strange thing. I think when um, at, the, 
in the 90s, especially when people were looking at uh, stand-up comedy, they, they were looking at the stand-up comics act as sort of shorthand for a series. And that they, they could see in each joke an episode and something could be built around it. But you don't take into account that the stand-up needs to have acting ability, which a, you know, a number of them don't. Uh, because it's a different art form. It's it's totally totally different, um, and I, I think uh, it, it is unfair to expect that of a stand up comic because stand up comedy is such a, an incredible art into itself. As is sitcom acting, and acting in general is such an incredible art into itself. It's a I don't think that people are necessarily good at both. You know, you have a few examples of people that were incredible at it. Um, you know, like Seinfeld or Roseanne, but. Uh, really, it's it's a it's a hard transition to make. You know, it's a hard transition to go from uh, late night comedy clubs to eight o'clock on a Wednesday night um, in television. You know, it's it's so limiting language wise, idea wise. Um, it's it's a totally different art form.